For those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Micah Christensen. And um, I was invited here by Brad Roberts and Britton Roney, who are involved here at, the, uh, at, at Zion's Mercantile. I be, do this lecture once a week in Salt Lake at an art gallery called Anthony's Fine Art. And that's a family gallery. We've been around for about 30 years. And uh, my father started it. And we have become more and more involved in art over the past 10 years. In fact, it's gone from being about 20% of our business to about 70% of our business is now in paintings. And because of that, I went on and got my doctorate in fine art at the University of London. And my specialty there was on how artists were trained in the 18th and 19th centuries. And uh, not just the 18th and 19th centuries. When you learn about the 18th and 19th centuries in artists, you learn about the history of art from antiquity until the end of the 19th century. And uh, one day, um, Joseph Bricky and his students at the Beaux-Arts Academy in Salt Lake, a world-class um, uh, institution, education for artists, wandered in and uh, we talked about doing something together. And it turned into this, where once a week, we take an old master and we go through their career and some of their principal pieces. And we try and do it in an hour and a half, which is insane. There's no possible way we're going to be able to get through Velasquez today in an hour and a half. But I hope that by the end of it, you're going to be able to know more about um, not only his masterworks, what the, the, his best pieces, um, which it's hard to break down what are his best pieces, because we're not going to be able to cover all, all of my favorites even. But we're going to uh, try and figure out how Velasquez became Velasquez. Um, and our theme this year, you're kind of coming halfway into this theme. Don't feel bad, though, because we're going to catch up has been Rome, its influence on artists over the years. And the reason we're doing that is because the Beaux-Arts Academy is going to Rome um, in, at the, uh, in the end of spring, beginning of summer. And uh, we're going to be taking some clients there, too. So you'll see a lot of focus on Rome and some of the things we're doing. Not too much. How many here by show of hands have been to Rome? OK, how many here by show of hands have been to Spain and seen works by Velasquez in person? OK, so we've got some. We've got some. That's good. Spain is not always on the tourist track for people. But I'm going to start. I'm going to do a deep dive right in on one of my favorite paintings by Velazquez. And I'm going to, I mean, the reason I'm going to go right into Velazquez and, and, a, and, a, and this major work, which was, we believe, the last painting he did, is because I want to give you, before we go into the beginning of his career, an idea of where he arrived as a mature artist. This painting is not called Las Meninas. That's a typo. Sorry. Bad copy and paste job. It's called Las Hilanderas, or The Weavers. And it is, I mean, what does this look like it's a scene of? What's going on here? And you're, you're probably going to be right, because there's more than one thing that's going on in here. But just give me, give me some things that you see that, that are happening here. Spinning wheel. Spinning wheel, OK. So the, 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 that, that would go along with the title of the weavers, right? So you got a spinning wheel. Is there a play going on in the background? It looks like a play, doesn't it? Right? Tapestries? Beautiful tapestry that's in the background. All key moments in it. So the story Las Hilanderas, it's also called, or the, the fable of Arachne, or what's, is, it, is that the right word in English? Because I'm translating it in my mind from the Spanish, Arachna, Arachne. And the story of Arachne is that she was this mortal woman in Greek myth who was unbelievable and unrivaled by humans in the weaving of tapestries, which, by the way, in, in the ancient world up until medieval times was the most valuable thing in your house. You know how today, I remember my sisters when they got married, they got cedar chess and they'd been building up cedar chess. That's a tradition that goes back to antiquity. Because when you got married, the most valuable thing you could bring into marriage was not gold or silver, it was textiles. And the textiles were hung in the house and they were, they were your liquid wealth. They were the best thing that you had to carry around. And so for Arachne to be the best at tapestries was to be a really big deal in her age. And she bragged one day that she was so good she could beat Athena, who was the goddess of wisdom and also of, uh, of a lot of tasks like weaving. 
Athena, the goddess, was not happy, disguised herself as an old woman, and came down and challenged Arachne, who's on the far right, to the, uh, and there's Athena on the far left, to a battle of weaving. And in the story, it's so great, and it's, I wish we could go through the whole thing and read it word for word, it's so great. Arachne actually beats Athena, but when she beats Athena, she, the tapestry she creates is of all of Zeus's wives and all of the affairs he had. And Athena is the wife of Zeus. So not only did he, she spit in her face by beating her, but she also spit in her face by showing her husband's misdeeds in the tapestry that she wove. Well, Athena wasn't going to have that. Boom, she turned her into a spider. And that's how we get arachnids. The idea that arachne is the, uh, is the mother of all the spiders. But Velasquez, he doesn't just do this as a, um, this is what makes him so great is that this is the class of his day. They know this story because the, all, the, 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 the language of European culture is not just the, the, um, the, the, the Bible, but it's also the myths of Greece and Rome. And what he does is he goes into a room. We actually know, we had charts of this room. The building was burned down. This is the old palace in Madrid. Um, it burned down in the, in the, early, in the late 16, early 1700s. Here you are in, the, in a room in the palace in Madrid, and he has pay, positioned the women who are actual weavers in the palace as the women who are in the fable and the servants. And she has, in the background, a tapestry that actually hung in the royal palace of the story of Arachne as the backdrop. So you have him showing this beautiful genre scene in the foreground that is both the story and the common people that are in there with the juxtaposition of this is the fable that's going on in the next room that's happening. And I want to just show you a couple of details as we're going. I've got a remote here that I'm trying to figure out. This is a Fairly, a very high quality image. And by the way, this is one of the most copied passages in the 19th century, right, right here. I want to say, let me, I've got a, a, a little laser thing. This right here is copied over and over again. I've got on my computer, and I didn't bring it because we just don't have time. I've got Zorn's copy of this, Andrew Zorn. I've got Manet's copy of it, Corbet's copy of it, Soroya's copy of it, and Sargent's copy of it. And I can actually put Sargent and, um, and Soroya and, no, yes, yeah, Sargent and Soroya and Manet in the same room on the same day. In there, according to the, to the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Prado, the, uh, the Prado Museum's uh, records. And, you know, why would they copy that? Why is that so fascinating to those artists of all these moments? Why do you think? You as an artist, when you qualify something as beautiful, that means, that means a lot. It's true. I don't know if this is actually going on in your head. It goes on in my head when I see it. But I think, here's somebody, as, as artists, they're often, even at this time, caught in the classical tradition to the point that they're almost cutting and pasting classical scenes and statues. Is that a classical pose? Is it informed by classicism? Is it a pickup post? I mean, is, when I, when I, it is beautiful. And, and p what, what makes it beautiful? Go ahead, Joseph. Well, I, for me, one of the things that is so appealing, for one, that figure epitomizes Velasquez. Okay. Everything that is so marvelous to painters about this painter of painters is right there in that figure. You know, the, the facility of those lines, it, it looks so easy to do. Yeah. It's sort of like a fantasy world for an artist. To, this is how you think of art. This is how you feel about art as an artist. Yeah. This is just going to flow off my brush. Yeah. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen. But, <laughs> but Velasquez makes it feel like that's what happened. Yeah. And so in some ways, it's, the artist looks at this and says, that's what it feels like to paint hmm. when I look at Velasquez. <clears throat> that's how I imagine my life as a painter. Hmm. Is it just close off the brush and look at the gesture, how, how wonderfully that hand is extended 
and <coughs> so he has the form, all the sense of form that you have in, you know, highly finished classic. It feels solid. It feels like a solid model, doesn't it? But, but and the, part of the question that I have when I look at, at his work is how did he know when to stop? There's a, there's a, I, I was listening to an interview with John Lasseter, the producer behind a lot of Pixar films, and he was being interviewed by Terry Gross uh, on NPR, and he, she asked him about the first 10 minutes of the movie Up. Um, and I, if you've got kids, you've probably seen it a dozen times, right? And in the movie Up, the first 10 minutes is sound, black and white, no dialogue. And she asked, why did you make that choice? And he said, well, we looked at some research that said, if you're listening to radio with no images, your brain fills in the visual imagery that's being discussed in the narrative of the radio. And if you see a film with no sound, your mind is filling in the audio portion of it. Literally, the audio port of your brain is lighting up in an MRI machine where they test this. But if you see sound and video at the same time, your brain shuts down its participation. It becomes passive in the process. And he said, so we made the choice because, and I don't know how emotional you get when you watch the first 10 minutes of Up. I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. Where, where the woman dies. And when I look at Velasquez, I think, I don't know. I mean, there's no way he could have known that. But on some level, he had to have known that if you suggest solidity, or suggest something, you don't have to paint it all the way because as a, a, he almost makes you a participant in his paintings by leaving her in shadow, by suggesting that being held in her hand. The, um, this moment here where the wheel is spinning, you feel that the wheel is spinning that she's working on and you see the conversation that's happening at the same time. I mean, even this moment in the background, look at how brushy it is. And you'd think, okay, Mike has just blown up a very, a very small port of the portion of the painting. If you've seen this in person, this portion of the painting is this big. It's big. So he didn't, I'm not blowing up just a small portion of the painting for you. He left it that suggested. It's a deliberate choice on his part. And then even moments like this where, I mean, that, is that a club or a leg when you look at it here, right? And then you, and isn't that the most beautiful cat? If you're a cat, I'm not a cat lover and I love that cat, <laughs> right? That is an unbelievable cat. But when you, when you put it all together and you look at that leg in the context of that piece, it's a beautiful compositional choice because look at the triangle that's formed. That's not, a, I mean, it's almost a Raphael-esque choice of geometry, right? Of you've got the, 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 volu the, the, the motion of your eye is drawn down here and it's pulled back up and then it's pulled into this space and you're pulled into here. It's lights and darks that are compositionally you're making choices with. It's colors that he's drawing your eye around. The red here, the red here, the red here, the, the, the places where it's dark and where it's light. This is him at his full glory. Up until the 19th century, this was considered Velasquez's masterpiece. We hardly discuss it now. We always discuss Las Meninas. I'm not saying that's a bad choice because Las Meninas is pretty amazing and we're going to look at it at the end. But I wanted to start off with this because I just wanted you to see where he ended up. He died um, of a cold, basically. He, uh, he was, by the end of his life, he spent more time as, a, as a, an administrator in the court because he was so close to the king. And his job was often to go ahead of the king and his entourage in order to make sure that places were secured where they were going to stay. And he went out in a, uh, in a terrible rainstorm over two days in order to get there. And uh, he died of the cold that he, um, or pneumonia that he received. He was only, um, he died, let's see, 1599 is when he was born, died in 1660. So, I mean... 61 years, 61 years old. That was it. And uh, he'd only done at that point 115 paintings. That's all he'd done. And this is one of his last works. So with that, let's start at the beginning of Velazquez. Velazquez came from Seville. So Seville, if you're not familiar with the geography of Spain, I don't expect you to be, Madrid here is in the middle of the capital, and Seville is right here. Seville is very important in its position in the history of Spain. It was considered at the time um, that, uh, 
that uh, Velazquez was born into, the new Rome of Europe. It was literally called Nueva Roma by a lot of people. And that's because the Spanish um, had discovered the new world, even though it had been discovered in 1492, um, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He landed, I think it was in the Dominican Republic. Wherever it was, it was near the Caribbean. And there is not much gold there, right? It, it wasn't until about 100 years later that they discover the gold mines first in Mexico, which is what we think of when we think of, of the new world and gold. But the Spanish found way more silver than they found gold. In fact, they found so much silver in Peru where the Inca were um, in this mine that's now called Porto Si, that in Spain they now call it, um, whenever they're talking about something as being a lot, like that's a, that's a whole lot of something. They'll say that's a Porto Si of something. This is how much gold they found. They increased within 50 years the money supply for the entire world by 800%. It destabilized Ming China and destabilized Japan, overthrowing their governments because the money had messed up the economies of Asia from the money that they had found in the New World. And they're bringing what they called the Spanish treasure ships two times a year from Spain. They would go. They would go around, um, they'd go from Peru down the coast of, of, uh, of the Americas, and they would come up to uh, Spain, up through, the, uh, the, through this river right here, and they would unload them in Seville, and then they would go by donkey to Madrid. But by the time it got to Madrid, 80% of the money was spent. And it was, <laughs> it was spent... Um, it was spent by, um, by the royal court. They had a lot of debts. And it was also spent on the amazing buildings and uh, churches, artisans that were working in Seville. The best in the world were there. And Velazquez was a beneficiary of the system. The first art school in Spain, el, uh, let's see, La Escuela de Santa Maria de Hungria, is, is still there today. Um, and it was, it was founded in the 1500s. And the main teacher, the one who founded it all, his name was Francisco Pacheco. And this is a work by Pacheco done in 1628. It would have been done after Velazquez was done, but he had left. But frankly, Pacheco's style didn't change a great deal. Um, he's the kind of painter who spent his entire career working in Seville. And you'd think that maybe Seville, I, it, that, that makes him sound somewhat colloquial, somewhat provincial, but really, Seville had a long history. They had texts that had been translated since the 800s in, in Greek, in Hebrew. It was also a center of the Islamic uh, people when they were living for 800 years and ruling Spain. Seville had a vibrant culture. And in addition to that, you had a lot of the, the, the Flemish that were coming down from Belgium, which is part of controlled Spain at the time. They were working there. And Pacheco was kind of the grandmaster. He wrote a book called El Arte de Pintura, which became the first manual for painters, really, in, uh, in his time. It was the most widely, one of the most widely published books. And uh, I'll show you a cover of it. But just looking at this, um, what is Pacheco good at? What does he do? If you, were, if you had to guess. I mean, not guess. If you just had to say, we're not guessing. There's no right answer. Just tell me what you think he's good at when you look at this painting. Faces? Good at faces. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's, om it's always hard to look at a Pacheco painting. The reason it's hard to look at a Pacheco painting is because he painted almost exclusively for churches that were filled with candlelight, and that's where the, you'd have lamp black that would get all over the paintings. It's very hard to see a Pacheco in its original quality because they were used. They were used paintings, which is what also made Pacheco wonderful. So faces, he's great at faces. That's true. I would I, I'd absolutely agree with that. What else is he doing well? Very well defined. Everything's well defined. <clears throat> and there's a, a contrast between the light and the dark. It's very obvious. So compositionally, that, yeah, a lot of compositional intelligence. And we're seeing this in isolation. We're not seeing it in the church in relationship to the architecture that it would normally be seen in. Um, this, would have, this was in the church of San, Santa Ines. And it had other moments from the, from the life of Santa Ines that was in it. You've got to imagine that if you were in a church, you would have that candlelight flicker on it, 
right? So it's not seen in the light we see here. So the faces may, may look a little bit alive with that contrast of the dark and light that were on it. He's very, he's very good at doing large scale works. Um, many of the paintings, this isn't a huge painting, but it's not tiny either, right? I mean, for, this is still pretty big, 169 inches. How big is that roughly? You know, 17 feet high. You know, some of the biggest works he ever did were 34 and 40 feet high. This is an artist who's used to working in large scale. And um, you wouldn't know that. You could, if I had not shown you the size, I don't know what you would have guessed size-wise. What I would have said, oh, you know, that's a, that's a 30 by 24 or something like that. That's what I would have said. He's terrific at, at taking these large scale paintings and make them readable. But what he really is spending and being paid the most for is not these, it's these. Hold on a second, I'm gonna skip ahead here. It is polychrome sculpture, religious sculpture, that is being used every day. And he is working with an art artist named Ricardo Martinez Montañez, who is considered and called everywhere the Michelangelo of wood. He would work with Pacheco, um, and they had a large studio that would work together on this, where they would take important religious figures of their day. Think, you know, we're in Utah. Think if you had a President Hinckley that had been frozen at his most famous moment, right? And you were capturing, or even, you know, and you, and, and, you know, we don't have television at this time. They had churches, and they had the storytelling ritual of parading these through the streets. So you're taking these, usually in dark and under candlelight, and look at these tears. I've seen this in real life a couple of times now, once in the church and once not. And when I saw it in the church with the candlelight flickering on it, it looked like he was weeping. It was a surreal feeling. Montañez does the sculpture. Pacheco does the painting on it. And it's supposed to look as real as possible. Velasquez later... Um, does a, a portrait of Montañez as a dedication to him because Velázquez is growing up around this. He's growing up around the big churches and the, the, the enormous canvases that are being done by Pacheco. And he's growing up a, around the sculptor studio of, uh, of uh, uh, Montañez. Um, he did this portrait much later of Montañez, which is a fabulous portrait of his teacher. And at the time, uh, Montañez had been, at this time, Velázquez, this is later in his career, this is when he's grown up, um, Montañez had been asked to come to do in clay a portrait of Philip IV of Spain, the king, so that it could be taken, the, the clay piece could be taken to Pompeo Leone, who's a remarkable sculptor that's working in Italy. And, and then Leone was going to bronze the piece. So Velasquez, out of deference to Montañez, does not attempt to paint Montañez's work. He just does the sketches of it, but he does a portrait of Montagnes working on it. It's the only depiction we have of Montag Montagnes. Well, I want to show you the first work that we have by Velázquez that he's, that he's created at the age of, I believe it's 17. The date's wrong. It says 1326. It should actually say 1617 um, is when he did this. This is the earliest known work. And a word of caution before we discuss this. This work has been rolled up, cleaned, ironed, rolled up, cleaned, ironed for hundreds of years. And well, the first thing that you would clean, it's every time a new, art, a, a new artwork would be bought by somebody, if, 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 it, was, if uh, it was passed on from one place to another, you can't by ox cart or by ship carry a lot of paintings that are stretched. You gotta unstretch them, you gotta roll them up, and when you get them, the first thing you do is clean them. And then you have to repaint them. So what's been repainted here multiple times are the faces, because those are the parts you worry about, and the hands. And when we talk about it in art history, or as you know, in auction houses, we say they've been skinned. And I think that's a great term for it, because it means they've been skinned several times. The layers have been pulled off. And it's always the faces and the hands. But the original parts that usually don't get touched are the still life elements and the background elements. So when you look at this, you're, not, you're looking at maybe 40% Velázquez. When we look at other Velázquez pieces, especially the big ones that were done in Madrid, those are pieces that have been in the Royal Collection for over 500 years. And they haven't been rolled up. 
and they're some of the most beautifully preserved paintings we have. So that's my preamble. I won't say anything else about it, but I just want you to look. What, I want you to look at this now that you know that and say, what does Velasquez do great as a 17-year-old? Set aside the fact that it's a 17-year-old. What is he doing great with this first painting? <laughs> Everything. Can you be a little more specific? <laughs> <laughs> Composition, what about it? It's great at making your eye move around. Look at this. You've got kind of this, this, uh, this triangle going on here, right? But they're all overlapping, which is all the great artists. You know, this is the lessons of Raphael. That you're, look, you're drawn almost immediately to his face, but then you're pulled down to his face and his instrument, which then pulls you over here, and you look at the still life for a moment, and then you go up to this fellow's face, and you look back at him again. It's this circular. The composition is brilliant. And then there are all kinds of great tangential sidetracks that it takes you on to when you want to. What else? What else do you like about this? I think the draping is beautiful. The draping is beautiful, isn't it? Can you tell that he's somebody who's been around people who are carving a lot of drapery in wood? Um, those guys, can you imagine having to make wood drapery look realistic? You've got to be great at making the wood drapery realistic because that's one of the things that will go bad immediately, right, if you're working on drapery. Okay, what else is he good at? It feels like he's really captured a very fluid moment. Yeah. It feels like this was a scene that existed and he was able to, to, to capture that. I am convinced that that's the thing that would have astonished viewers at the time. We're so used to seeing movies, we're used to seeing um, photographs that capture the instantaneous. And when you look at this and think that even mirrors back then were basically polished metal, this would have astonished them. And it's what astonished um, them about Caravaggio. And Caravaggio would play with this all the time. We don't know if Velasquez, we, we can't prove that Velasquez saw Caravaggio. Many art historians have lost their master's degree trying to prove <laughs> that Velasquez and Caravaggio, Velasquez knew Caravaggio. We don't know that, but he's definitely in the air and this instantaneousness, this real life capturing the moment is part of it. Yes? So if you compare it even to the painting that you showed a couple slides back. Oh yeah. I'm gonna go back up there. Oh, yeah. slides no, back. it's all right. So that one, this is very oh my heavens. Yeah. Uh, even just the way that the coating is carved and layered, and, or not carved, painted, yeah. and shown in this one versus the more character style of the other one. I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a key point. I don't want you to walk away and say the reason that, that, that Pacheco must be a bad painter because he couldn't do this. I know that's not what you were saying. It's a different ethic that is very interesting because the ethic of Pacheco is platonic, neoplatonic we would call it. It's the idea that painting is supposed to take you out of the everyday and give you models from heaven. The idea is that it's supposed to take you out of the sordid dust of life that is earthy and full of everything that is fallen man basically and it's supposed to give you an idea of what the heavens are. Right? So you'd go to church and you'd see this. This painting is not that by any means. It's not a question of Pacheco can't do this. There are some wonderful Pacheco pieces that I chose not to show, especially one that he did regularly of a lamb that was tied up as a symbol of Christ being tied up that Surboran also did versions of that you may be familiar with. But it's this wonderful everyday, it's a very different approach. And it's the idea that the everyday is worth painting as well. Well, a lot of his early, yes, go ahead. What's going on with that bowl? With the bowl? The bowl, B-O-W, the violin. Oh, yeah, now you are a musician and I know this. <laughs> Why do you ask? So, so tell us about this as a musician. I'm sort of posed as always playing, but he's not playing. And why is the bowl sticking up? There's that vertical red piece that just sort of spits out. You know, I, doing anything. I don't know. And, with and I, would, I would have to chalk this up to a couple of things, to potentially do a few things. Art historians love to 
add conjecture. I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, I would say, for one, um, he's a young man and he's probably not a musician. He may not know. It may be just as simple as he doesn't know what he's doing and it's purely for compositional choice, right? Because it does draw attention to the fact that he's got a bow. He's got a, he's got a violin. Why, that, why not just leave it out? I don't know. Well, go ahead. You know. Maybe he's plucking. Could be. I don't know. You're a violinist too. You two meet at the flagpole after and duke it out. Okay, duke this one out. But it's compositionally, it's interesting that it crows, it, it cuts across that figure. And also, look at how skinned it is. That's another thing. Is that maybe it was painted? It could also be painted in later. You can see some of the clothing through it. Anyway, let's move on to the next piece. Yeah. Oh, my heavens. Oh, my heavens. And we're going to see this kind of thing in other paintings. I'm going to move to the next one because this still life, it's also in this. These still life elements of Velazquez. This is something that the civilian school of artists is terrific at. They're some of the best still life painters alive. And Sur Buran, another artist that I hope we'll get to, he was a remarkable still life painter. And they sh Velazquez shows off up until his late age at some of his still life abilities. Um, I'm just going to zero in for just a moment on this. Look at how, if anybody has ever tried to um, poach an egg, and you've stirred the water and then dropped the egg in, you'll notice what's going on there, right? This kind, and he's, what he's done there is terrific because he's, he's taken a loaded brush and he's, he's pulled it throughout there and left it as a kind of um, a, a thin layer of paint over the very top before the varnish was put on, right? And, and look at that bend in the shadow of the knife and the bowl. He's showing off here as a young man. Look at, look at these, um, look at the, all the different things he's done. I've, I should have zeroed in on that, that moment, but this moment. Look at this little bit of, of, of shallots that he's got right here. Anyone who's handled shallots, how hard would it be to paint a shallot, right? Garlic, at least you've got the contrast, contrast of lights and darks. A shallot, that's a pretty muddy, but also translucent puzzle to try and do. And, He's, how's he doing, is this perspective real perspective at the bottom? I see, Howard, I see you shaking your head immediately like, like I'm insane, that that's, re that's not real perspective. What is he doing? He's he bent that space forward so we can see it and then it kind of turns as you get to the side of head. You're simultaneously looking straight at them and on top of the table, right? That's what great art can do that, right? And normally it would really bother me. It doesn't bother me in this painting. And I don't know why it doesn't bother me. It bothers me when Cezanne does it. But it doesn't bother me when Velasquez does it. And he's still a young man. I mean, he's, he's 18, 19 years old at this point. And um, look at just these moments of the hands that he's got. These beautiful moments. And, and the little details of, of this this pot that he's, he's captured the light coming off of the glaze. And he's showing off, I mean, what do you do with the bottom left hand of that painting? Well, you add in a beautiful brass pot and you do it incredibly. This, uh, this painting is, um, I'm gonna show you another one that he does. And this is his first true narrative painting that we have by him. It's uh, Christ in the House of Mary and Martha. Now, if you remember the story of Mary and Martha, who wants to briefly tell us what happens in the House of Mary and Martha? All of you uh, people who have attended Sunday school over the years. I know there's some of you out there, at least. So what's the story? Christ is in the house. Okay. Mary's at his feet as he listens to him teach, and Martha comes out from cooking and says, can you send my sister back here to help me out? <laughs> yeah. And then do you remember the line that Christ says to, to Martha? She has chosen the good part. Yeah. You, you say you're worried about a good many things, yeah. but she's chosen the good part. So in this painting, you've got a painting within a painting. You've got, and, and it's, there are a few interpretations of this. One is, they're in the kitchen. The, here's the kitchen. And Christ is in the other room teaching, and we're looking through the window of the kitchen into where Christ is. Another one is, is that this is a painting on a wall, and it's, it's, it's an icon. And another one is, this is potentially Velasquez doing a kind of mirror onto the situation. And we are standing where Christ 
Mary and, and um, supposedly John the Beloved are, right? And this, where, where is Martha in this who's worried about a good many things? She's the old woman bossing around their servant. And you can imagine what she's saying because I grew up with somebody who is quite like this. It was, you're doing this wrong. You need to do this part. And Martha's totally concerned. And she's just trying to be a good host, right? And she's saying, now he's going to want to eat after he's done talking. And you got to have this ready. And I planned it this way. And do we have enough of this, enough of that? And, and Christ is in the other room teaching. She's missing it because she's bossing around the servant girl. And Velasquez, who's done a number of scenes like this before, works his strengths into a narrative. Isn't that brilliant? He's taken everyday um, civilian, um, uh, civilian is the word I'm looking for, um, a set of, of, of things. You've got the fish that are, they're pulling out of the ocean, these beautiful eggs, there's our garlic that's right there. These are some sausages and peppers that are put together. And look at that hand. Oh my gosh. It's just unbelievable. And then he's got Christ and this, this story that's in the background that's happening. And what I love about it too is that, um, I'm going to go back, is that if you were a painter and you had to emphasize the, the moral of this story, would you make the part about Christ and Mary and John the Beloved the bigger part of the story that you'd paint? Or would you make the part about Martha telling her servant to do it better the, the, uh, the, the bigger part? I think it's an interesting choice. I think it would be an interesting painting if it was the other way around. If you were looking through into the kitchen and you saw Martha. But in this way, I mean, it's, there's a lot you can read into it. As an art historian, you just love to do this kind of thing. And you'd say, well, I mean, in this one, he's saying that we're all Marthas, right? And that our struggle is to try and get into the other room. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece. And he's only, um, he's only 18, 19 years old at the point that he does this. Well, this painting, the reason we have this painting and the reason we have the next one we're going to show you is because Pacheco knows there's talent there. He, he, he's the grand dom. That's the wrong word because he's a man. What would you call it? The warlock? That doesn't work either. <laughs> Whatever it is in, uh, in Seville, he's the, big, he's the big kahuna. Go with that one. And uh, he, um, he is being asked on a regular basis to send artists to the royal court where their main job in the royal court is to prepare not only to create an atmosphere of learning and beauty within the court, but the main job of the painter is to create diplomatic Im images that can be used to marry off your children to the right royal family. So you gotta have a great portrait painter. And Pacheco, not only his daughter has married Velasquez now, so Pacheco's the father-in-law of Velasquez. He wants him and his daughter to do very well. They're married at the age of 17, so before this painting was done. He says to Velasquez, get your best paintings together, and in fact, why don't you do a portrait, and why don't you do one of me? And we'll send it to the king. And, and I will put it out as the, uh, as, as the image that you should be doing to... Uh, to, uh, to show off your, uh, your talents. Now, I want to show this in contrast with this because the court painter at the time, Balthasar, is a great court painter. And these are the works that he's doing by comparison. So if you had to contrast that with, I'm going to do a close-up, this, what would you say? What's the difference? In your minds. And I wish I had them side by side. I didn't do it. Yes. Well, this is so 3D real. The skin looks real. It feels real. The features. The other one seems more two-dimensional, more flat. Yeah. More, um, less modeling. Less, yeah, this is less modeling. There's almost no modeling in the other one. The other one, it, 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 it's all about the costume, almost, in the other one. Right? And, uh, I mean... 18 years old, 19 years old. Look at this. What is he good at? Everything. Everything. <laughs> everything. Okay, I agree with you, but let's try and break down everything. <laughs> we have to break down everything. What is he doing here that makes it such a... Realistic isn't a word they would have used. It didn't exist. They would have said from nature. What makes this work? He's not idealized. <clears throat> He's not and I'm going to show you what he did to the king when he gets when he gets his hands on him. Yeah. Well, he's discerning of form and shape, 
and in a way that if I were to ask him to do my portrait, I might be a little worried. It's like <laughs> There's nothing you should be worried about. <laughs> you look great, Joseph. <laughs> well, it's sort of like saying, tell me about myself. Yeah. You know, when you have a painter like this, who's going to really... Oh, yeah, that's interesting. And, and you're going to see, you know, he's going to see things in the king or in his subject that this other artist, he's just painting preconceptions. And yeah. Costume, and you're associating those things with the portrait. Yeah, remember, none of these things are being signed. They're being showed to the potential suitor as this is who this is. They don't even care who the painter is. Yeah. yeah. So picking a photographer for who you're going to have represent you in a dating website or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. Not that you have any experience no. in that. <laughs> but he's going to show all, all yeah. the truth of your face. Absolutely, absolutely. And I saw you had a comment, and then I saw another one over here. The lighting comes from above, which makes the, the shadows on the face more isn't, is that an odd choice? You're a portrait painter. Is that an odd choice to have the lighting come from above? What does that do to it for you when you look at it? It, it just it makes all the shadows come up. You know, you'd never want to do that for a woman. No, you wouldn't. And you know, this is the kind of thing that, I mean, he's a very stately looking man here, right? This is a very fashionable and expensive collar. I don't know if you've ever seen these collars and how they're put together, but when you take these collars, they're, they're, um, they, 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 um, they get unwound and they're about 30 feet long, right? And they only can be worn a few times before they need to be put back together again, especially you know in those days because the streets aren't paved, so dust is getting collected in all of their folds. So it, you can't afford to have this collar unless you're very wealthy, right? It's, he sh this is a gentlemanly thing, and it makes his head stick out quite a bit, doesn't it? Do I have another comment before I go on? Yeah. I was just going to say, it's really interesting, in contrast to the other painting, he, his use of the contrast of light and dark, you know, to have the whites, the brilliant whites, yeah. and, and the, you know, the light um, from on the forehead yeah. with the really dark background, it does draw your eye to to the faces rather than yeah. just kind of being, uh, oh, here we've got a painting and we're kind of spread all over everywhere. Yeah, thank you. You know, I remember um, I, I interviewed in front of a group of people a few weeks ago the artist uh, Dan Wilson, who won his award for a life-size painting of Christ that he did at the, um, at the Springville Museum of Art's Art and Religion show, and a religion and spirituality show. And I said, what do you look for in a model? And he said, I look for the eyes. I look for kind eyes. Um, I think it's a, this is a very different approach than painting the eyes and looking for kind eyes, isn't it? This is almost a Rembrandt-esque, um, you're going to fill in the eyes for me as a viewer. I don't know, Rembrandt's not a good comparison because Rembrandt would do, his eyes had a lot of color in them. They were just painted in such a way that they were a little, that they were dispersed and soupy. These are almost not there, right? These are almost not there at all whereas Rembrandt would have spent a lot of time in them. And it's such an interesting choice for a portrait to not focus on the eyes in the same way. Well, he goes to Madrid. Oh, this is another piece that he does. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. But this is one of my favorite pieces. I wish we could spend a lot of time on it. It's also part of his audition kit for the royal family. And I love it. It's, it's so hard to show paintings on a projected screen because you can't get the, the painting. You, it goes the opposite way. When you're looking at a painting in real life, light is paint, bouncing off of it to you and it's going through all the oil, layers of oil on the way back. When you're looking at this, light's being projected on that and it's just, it's not the same thing. So um, forgive that in it. But look at, but it also is a wonderful contrast of the lights in it, right? Um, it's, it's a really interesting contrast. If you get up close, you can see it a little better. He is sending, and I think this is interesting, he goes down that route that you were talking about of not Pacheco, of these are heavenly models in a real, or, or in, a, in, a, in a surreal world. These are real people that he would have seen in Seville. He would have seen sailors from the African coast that were coming up. He's got a black African um, sailor. He's got these very rough men that look like they could have traveled miles to bring gifts. He also brings in his still life elements. And look at that Christ. Isn't that the, you don't even want to pinch his cheeks. It's almost Norman Rockwell-esque, that, that figure of Christ. And it almost doesn't fit, but that's a little bit of Pacheco, right? He makes him a little unearthly. He makes him a little supernatural. So he goes to Madrid, 
And I gotta, I, I, I know I'm, I'm going fast here. I, I, I'm gonna get caught in the weeds if I go too long because I just love talking about Velasquez. Just, just tell me if I'm talking too long about something. But in Madrid, and this is important to know, Madrid is a conjured place. What do I mean by that? I mean that, that Spain, even though it has been around for as long as any other country in Europe, it didn't have the capital of Madrid until the late 1500s. And the reason is, is because there are all of these provincial kingdoms that had been their own, they have their own economic centers, Valencia, Barcelona, Cordoba, you've got Sevilla, which has got its own area. And the king decides that he needs to have his own seat of power that's distinct from everyone else. And so he builds just like um, uh, the French build Versailles, outside of Paris, they build Madrid. And the town goes from a population of 10 to 15,000 in a period of a year to 250,000. So you can imagine, I come from Alpine, I live in Alpine, I don't come from there, but I live in Alpine, and the population there is roughly 15,000 people. If you can imagine it ballooning to 250,000 in a period of a year or two, that's what it was like. And they're pulling all of the best painters from the regions. And Velasquez goes there, and he's working alongside Bartolomé González Serrano. And Serrano um, is painting this, and the first portrait that Velasquez does of the king is this. People at the time remarked at how bad Velasquez did and how it was the ugliest portrait they'd ever seen of a king. And, uh, and uh, you know, Velasquez must have known it while he was doing it. We've seen other Velasquez's, right? And here's some of the interesting things. Manet was obsessed with the idea when he discovered Velasquez in the 1850s. He's obsessed with the idea that Velasquez made people seem real by putting them on a blank background. It seemed like they were coming out towards you. If he had put him on the background of the other pieces, it wouldn't have been as harsh, right? This is a very stark contrast, even compared to his other pieces. Well, and at the period to show a king without jewels and yeah. gold and symbols of power, yeah. that's pretty bold. We don't know, yeah, and we don't know who this was meant for. He was married at this point. You know, maybe this was just a test for him. Um, this is a very luxurious black silk that he's wearing. Black was the most expensive color of the 17th century. The second most expensive color was cochineal red, which came from insects taken off cacti in Mexico. And the third most expensive was lapis lazuli, which came from mines in Afghanistan, which we call ultramarine. They only had about 35 colors, and the Spanish only had access to about 17 because they didn't have all the mineral colors that everyone else did. But they did have this black, and this black is coming from logwood, which is in groves that's in the Caribbean, and it's being harvested by retired pirates, and three out of seven pirates are dying making this. It's expensive stuff. You kill a lot of pirates <laughs> while you're trying to get it, right? A lot of retired pirates die, because it's, it's poisonous sap. It comes from the sap of the tree. And that's, and so when we think of the Quakers and the Pilgrims in their very austere blacks and that they were in poverty, no, no, no. Those were expensive clothes. I'm not kidding. Those are some of the, those are the most expensive clothes they could have had at the time. And they were paying for it with beaver pelts. So here you've got the most expensive color that you could have had. He is showing off there. That's for sure, right? But you're right. It's not the gold. And it's definitely not this. These were painted like two years apart from one another. Right? So these are very close to one another. I'm not, I'm not, I, I picked this one deliberately because one is almost this posed theatrical scene of saints in a way. And it's not this realism. This realism is the wrong word. I got to get that out of my head. It's not accurate. It's not this naturalism. That, that he's using at this time. Well, he must have made an impression on the king because the king kind of puts him in charge of special projects and says, um, and maybe he made a bad impression in one way and a good impression in another because he says, you're not doing portraits for a while. He ends up doing a lot of portraits later, but he says, you're not gonna do portraits, you're gonna do my personal chapel. And he does one of my favorite paintings next that I, that, that I could spend forever on called um, Christ Contemplated by the Christian Soul. This is in the National Gallery in London, and it's in pretty good condition, so we can trust looking at it. 
And it's something that doctrinally um, was very specific to the Spaniards at their time. It's the idea that the way that you learn about the sacrifice and you get close to God is by understanding how he suffered for you. And you can only do that from a point of innocence and understanding almost as a child, a pr as, a, as a child um, looks at the world with fresh eyes. You had to look anew at Christ's suffering for you. There was a lot of really great poetry that we would call morbid now, but I love it. I mean, I think aesthetically I'm Catholic. Um, I don't know why it moves me so much, but they would say, you, you, oh Christian soul, you were one of the thorns on his crown that pricked his forehead. Here you've got this moment of the Christian soul here. We go to another image. You are this soul. And you, Christ is aware of you in his mind while he's going through the suffering. This is the moment after he's been brought in, after he's been put before the crowd, and before he's paraded through the streets, he's whipped, right, with the cat of nine tails. And he's, and he's tied to this post. And you've got this, you've got the cat of nine tails right here, this, this, this awful thing, and you've got blood that's right here and you've got the rope he's been, the, the, he's been tied with this very waxen cord that's biting into his arms and there's blood that's coming from where that is. I mean, it's a very evocative piece. Is it gory? I don't know if I'd call it gory. I think it's, I think it's suggestive more than it is actually gory. And you are the soul and this is the angel showing it to you in that moment. Um, I want you to just look at this and I want you to, tr I want to ask you to, to, in your, to forget for a moment that these are figures and I want you to look at this as a still life. Just like his civilian pieces that we've looked at before. What does he bring from his still life world into this? The bright white, you see this, br the, br the brilliant whites and, the, and the, those folds are miraculous, aren't they? that are in there. I mean, they used to have in the 18th and 19th centuries in the academies in Europe, a class devoted for your four-year education entirely to, full, to, to drapery, they called it. And he's, he's got it. He's got the drapery. What about that rope? Isn't that a phenomenal rope? Oh, my heavens! Look at how it weaves its way around the body. And you don't even see it right there. You just see it come out the other end. And you see the shadow of Cass, and you see, and, and it draws your eye around. Isn't that a beautiful device compositionally to make your eye go along his body to see where the ropes are? I mean, what painter would have confidently left that strip hanging down from the bottom? I mean, it's just, you would have just left the column. You would have tied the rope off way earlier as a painter. But it's a brilliant thought. And we don't have, we, we have like five drawings that, that are by Velasquez, two of which we're certain are by him. And so we, we, we don't know, and his, paint, his paintings, if you do radiography on them, you don't see under drawings. Um, so it's, it's hard to know how much he drew. But when you look at the foreshortening, which is that idea that, you know, if, you're, if I'm looking at my arm like this, that's easier to paint than you looking at my arm like this. That's foreshortening, right? You've got to get the mathematical perspective and make it look realistic as it's happening. Look at the foreshortening of his legs, the lower half of the legs and the modeling. Oh my heavens, those are the most beautiful legs. They are so beautiful. And look at the toes. I once had a, an artist uh, who had spent his entire life studying Bouguereau and, and um, and uh, Jerome tell me that you can tell the quality of an artist by looking at their digits. And how, how's he doing on his digits? Oh my gosh, unbelievable. And it's, it's everything, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's that he doesn't overdo it. Someone once told me that what made Velasquez a great painter was that he knew when to stop, right? He knew what just, he left out the unnecessary in a painting. And this painting has I mean, even that's that, how many painters would have known to put in that light shaft going from there to think of that, but then would have left this part blank. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable choices he's making as an artist. This is a drawing we think we have. 
And I say we think we have because it was destroyed in 1936. Before 1936, it wasn't attributed to Velasquez. Somebody looked at a copy of the drawing in the 1980s and said, oh, that destroyed thing, I think it was by Velasquez. <laughs> But there's a lot of evidence that it was by the other things, that by, by, the, by where we knew that the, destro the, 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 the uh, um, destroyed piece came from. O oh, ye who have taught art classes, if you had to judge Velasquez without even seeing his oil painting and he'd give you this drawing, what would you have said? Say, hey, I've got a great idea for painting. Here's a drawing of one of the main figures. <laughs> Have I got the green light, Teach? Should I go? <laughs> what, would you, what would you have said, Joseph? Well, yeah, you're, there's, there's, without knowing that association with Velasquez, you, you might say, you know, you could work on that figure a little bit more. <laughs> you could do. Yeah, and it's not entirely fair. It's just the only piece yeah. of evidence we got, right? Yeah. But you can see, even in that drawing, the effortless line and the gesture of the figure all kind of comes together. Yeah. Even though you might, you know, I might nitpick a few proportional things where the feet are a little small to the head and so forth, but, but there is, there is <coughs> an effortless sense that is signature Velasquez. Yeah. Yeah. And, and frankly, you see it and you think, he's not putting his heart and soul in this. He's getting the, the, what he needs out of it to do the thing. That is a really interesting way of putting it, that he's getting what he needs out of it. That it's, it's, it ultimately, he's a very practical painter. He's a very practical painter. And, and you know, we, we spend a lot of time in art education today, and they did in the 19th and 18th century, um, forcing artists to work a particular way. And I, I think, I'm not, I'm not a critic of that in the sense that I think that it was, it was unnecessary, but I do think that it's a, it's a broad approach, right? It's a broad approach to saying you need all of these skills. When Velasquez obviously didn't, I mean, at least what we know of, maybe we're going to find a cache of 50 of his drawings that we didn't know about. Um, I want to go to the next piece because what, before I go, I got to tell you, this is one of my favorite moments in the history of the world. Rubes, I'm not kidding. I'm being, I'm not, this is not just bombast. I really mean that. Um, so guess who is hired by the Spanish king to come in and to help him decorate a new hall that he's doing? Peter Paul Rubens. And Rubens comes in, he's mature. He's in his 50s at this point. And Rubens is, is, is there. And Velasquez is there. And Rubens, in his spare time, is copying Titian. So they share a studio space. Rubens and Velasquez, while Rubens is copying Titian. Can you imagine a more amazing period in the history of art? You've got the trifecta for about a year of Rubens, Velasquez, and Titian all communicating with one another. Titian had been dead for, you know, like 70 years or something like that. And you've got Titian here on the left, and you've got Rubens' copy of Titian on the right. We could spend hours talking about this and what he's doing. And, and, but, but if you are, if you're Velasquez, what lessons are you learning from Rubens while, it's go, while this is going on? And this is the piece that, that uh, Velasquez paints while Rubens is there. How different is this from the other things we've seen? In what way is it different? I should probably ask. Because it is very different. This is one of my favorite paintings of all time. Light background, interesting background, right? Placed outdoors, right? Have we seen a Velasquez placed outdoors? No, we haven't seen one. Subject wise, the subject is Bacchus. Bacchus, who's Bacchus? God of wine, he's the party god, right? Here's the great thing about Bacchus too, that he gets a bad rap because in ancient Greece, Bacchus always had Salinas with him, his father-in-law. And if you got Salinas drunk, he could prophesy. And so when you'd go, it was a very useful thing to get drunk. Even the, the ancient um, uh, 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 Persians used to say that you had to argue, argue an idea both drunk and sober. And if it made sense in both ways, it was a good idea. And I think the same is true for Bacchus. Bacchus is the, is the other side of it. You've got to have a Bacchus in your life. And, and, um, you've, but, but is it really Bacchus? Is he really doing a mythological scene? 
Or is he painting a bunch of roadside drunkards? The answer is yes, I think you're right. I'm not, and, and it's a trick question, right? It's both of them. It is an astounding piece. If we just go up a little closer on, on some of it. Um, it's his first, he's done some multifigural pieces, but this is different, right? There's a lot more going on in this than before. It also has these figures that are partially nude that he hasn't done before. I guess you could say the Christ is a partially nude one. I take that back. I take that back. Um, are there the still life elements that he's good at? Look at that unbelievable jug in this bowl. I've got, a, I've got a 1940s Taos painter copy of this. I've got a Joseph Brickey of this. And um, I want to assemble the whole painting on a wall in my house by different painters <laughs> someday. That's my goal. I don't know where we'd put it, honey. Do you know where we'd put it? I don't know. Anyway. But, okay, let's just talk about this for a minute. I, I know that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this for just a moment. First of all, look at some of the things he's doing from a narrative perspective. He's bringing this fellow in, which is interesting, because that also makes you feel like he's just walked into the scene, stumbled upon them, right? Which makes you feel like, on your end, that you've stumbled upon it from your side. He's also added in this figure in the dark. What's that all about? Why has he got that guy there? Artists? Compositionally, why would you do that? Balance. 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 There's that interesting balance right there, too. Are there any more reasons why you do it? I've got my own reason that I think he did it, too, which is different than balance. Even I'm not, balance is a great one. I think it adds depth to the painting, too. I think it immediately makes you feel like, I mean, if you'd taken this figure out, it looked like you'd go just a few inches into the painting and all of a sudden you'd be on the scene. This makes it look like there's several feet between you and him. On another level, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that lily white Bacchus. You know, drinking wine keeps you young. That's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he well, he, he does look godlike, doesn't he? And he's been stripped down to the waist, and he's white. And the and that is not a very Velasquez white. Or, or skin tone up until this point. Maybe the Christ was a little bit like that, but the Christ looked sanguine, right? It looked like it had been drained of blood. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Rubens painting? Yeah. You know, it had that male figure. Yeah, the one on the right. Which is, which is obviously uh, studied from life and uh, much more realistic than the female and the Titian. Yeah, he's updated Titian, hasn't he? Gosh, the modeling on that body. Holy cow. Yeah. It's, it is, and, and you know, Joseph, you had said, because we, we talked on Tuesday and Joseph was there. Um, you would said that this is one of the first paintings you fell in love with. Why? why and and you, you, you told a little, t tell us a little bit why that, why that was. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure, except that it speaks to me. All of Velasquez's work does, and this is one of the first pieces that struck me. Um, you know, it's a little bit Rockwellian. I grew up around, you know, Norman Rockwell's depiction of America. Yeah. And, and look at how Rockwellian those characters are. There's, there's something a little different than Caravaggio's work. Yeah. How he depicts humanity. Um, Caravaggio seems like everyone's just a bad dude on some level, right? There's just well, some negative. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted. But, but, you know, there's something, uh, there's a solidity 
to everything that Velasquez does. There's this yeah. facility with what he does that um, makes it feel effortless and, and makes, you know, as a painter, I look at that and think, I feel the paint, I understand the paint as paint. Yeah. I want to experience what it's like to paint like that. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, he, he must have learned a lot from Rubens. And Rubens, we know while he was um, there, because it's said in Pacheco's book, El Arte de Pintura, he says that Rubens convinced Velasquez to go to, uh, to Rome. And I've got, I've got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to, is that right? Is that right? Yeah, I've got 15 minutes left. If you have to go, you have to go. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible, I think it's Pope uh, where he was condemned people for drinking wine out of bowls. Oh, interesting. Because they had a large quantity. Oh, interesting. That, that deprived the lower class people from, from uh, nutrition because they used all the grapes for these bowls of wine. Oh my heavens. Oh my heavens. That is, I've never th heard that. That's fascinating. What's the reference for that again? Oh my gosh, that's fabulous. So, I mean, these guys are really going at it. They're drinking that much. Yeah, it's the kegs. So, so what Rubens does, he sends Velasquez to go to Rome. He goes his first trip to Italy. In Italy, he stays. Can remember, most powerful king in the world is Philip IV, the king of Spain. And who does his court painter go to stay with when he's there? He gets put up in, he, gets, he shacks up with the Borghese's in the Borghese gallery. And we know, we don't have any firsthand accounts of who was hanging out at this, at like any, any dinner conversations, but we know who was going to the Borghese's all the time. Velasquez is there, and so is Bernini. He had completed this three years earlier, and it was in the Borghese's house. Also there is Garrett von Honthorst, who had the most famous painting of the world at the time, who we're going to talk about this later, Christ Before the High Priest. Also was there was Poussin. So you've got, not only did you have Rubens and, kind of, and you know, Titian posthumously in the same room with Velasquez in Madrid, now you've got Velasquez, Bernini, Poussin, Harthorst, and probably a whole crowd of other people all at the Borghese's at the same time with the huge collection of classical statuary that the Borghese has collected. And Velasquez is there, and what does he decide to do? What would you do if you were an artist and you had to go there? I don't know if you do this. He does landscapes. Which is a really, I mean, you laugh, you laugh, and it's a really, and what's so fascinating to me, this is the brilliance of Velasquez, because he's not just doing a classical landscape. This is the Villa Medici, um, or Villa Medici, I don't know um, how, everybody pronounces it a little different way, Spanish, Villa Medici. And this is where, um, he's very close to the Borghese home, and Look, he doesn't even make it a balanced, symmetrical work. It's, he's deliberately doing an asymmetrical piece. He's also, look at what's more prominent than the beautiful classical statue. The two guards who are contrasted in their brown against the boards that are being boarded up in the derelict part of the garden. And he's got these beautiful trees which are cutting through vertically and this balustrade which he interrupts with a workman's cloth that's being hung over it. It's like, it's just, it's absolutely brilliant in my mind that he's going and doing this kind of 19th century plain air work. And here's another one that he does. The Pavilion of Cleopatra and Ariadne. Ariadne is, is this famous statue. There's one that's at the, this one is no longer in Rome. This one is the one that's at the Prado that he buys on the second trip to Rome. So he goes back and he buys the statue that he barely mentions in his, or in, in his quick, still, in his quick uh, landscape. And the other one of, of Ariadne is in the Vatican collection. This is the one that's in the Prado now. But I mean, look at these choices. He breaks off that colonnade with the branches of the tree, right? It is such an interesting choice that he is making as an artist. And we don't think of, as, of Velasquez as a landscape artist. If, we, if anything, I would have pictured him based on his other work of making that classical statue, the architecture, doing something like hyper-realistic with the figures almost, or natural, right? Very natural. Instead, 
This palette is also his kind of civilian palette with a little more green. That one's more civilian. It's not even the close-up still lifes. It's like he zoomed back the camera dramatically. And what is the first major piece that he does there? This, which almost never gets seen today. It's a sister piece to this. They were the same dimensions. This is a much more famous piece. This one's at El Escorial, El Real Monasterio de, uh, de San Lorenzo del Escorial, which is just outside of Madrid. You almost never see it. It's hard to get, get images. This is one I took myself and photoshopped to get the right proportions because it's, you're taking it from here. How's Velasquez changed in Rome with his figures? What's happened? What's different? Do you see the landscape, by the way? Isn't that a great landscape? He worked it in. It's a great landscape. Or worked in that approach, at least. Not the exact landscape. By the way, this is one of my favorite paintings when it comes to... We don't show it as that, that much. We should. Of the brothers trying to convince their father that Joseph's dead. Look, these guys just aren't good actors. <laughs> right? They're totally saying, Ugh, you know, he's not going to buy it, guys. We should just tell him that we threw him down a well and sold him some slavers. But look at how much space there is between the figures. Isn't that interesting? And he's also enhanced that idea of the moment. This is a very action-oriented piece. Yes? It looks so, to me, it looks like, and we think of Poussin as doing the, um, the landscapes, but this is also Poussin. You know, this is, and this is much closer to what we just saw, right? I mean, if I had to make a guess, an educated guess, as to somebody who was influenced by heavily, I think Poussin is a very good guess of something he's looking at more for this one, isn't he? It's interesting, his work, because he moves from kind of the tenebrism of the extreme realism into the light-and-dark contrast influence, like Caravaggio, and starts making it, like you're talking about, more naturalistic. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. I don't know. And you know, I don't think that this is a style that stayed with him very much. Because when I think of the other painting, the sister piece, this, and notice the difference in widths. So this is always height when you're measuring paintings. This is, so the height is 87. Look at the other one height, 88. Right? They're a quarter of an inch off. And look at the width of this one, 114. And the other one, 98. What happens to the other 16 inches? This part, can you see that line? Was glued on in Madrid. He painted it when he came back because he felt like it needed it. So they were originally side by side the exact dimensions of one another. They're so different. And I would love to ask him, and I don't know if he was showing off um, in, in showing the two different styles, but this looks much more like a marriage of a mature civilian artist working with the Browns, the still life elements, you know, and his Roman confidence in human figures. I mean, if you compare side by side, the confidence he has in figures with the one on the right versus the left, I would kill, and many of you probably would as artists, you would, you would ask the genie for the powers to paint pig figures in a composition like this. But look at the difference between them. There is a mile distance. How many figures in here are painted as full standing figures? You've got half of this guy, most of him, but part of it's drapery, wears his waist. This guy may be the most complete figure in the whole thing. And then he's covered up everybody else here. Where is that guy sitting, right? Where is that guy standing or sitting? It's almost as if he's cheated and we didn't know it until you see this painting. And then you see this painting and you think, oh my heavens, he's every figure. And the story behind this painting is great, by the way, the subject. The story is that Hephaestus or Vulcan, I guess is the Roman name and Hephaestus is the Greek name. He's the one who creates all the jewelry, all the contraptions for the gods, all the armor. And he's married to Venus. And Venus is, is in a long time dysfunctional relationship with Mars. And they're always sleeping with one another. And Apollo comes to tell Hephaestus or Vulcan, your wife, I just caught her with Mars. And look at the look on his face. 
I can't believe it. It's almost like the ultimate barbershop moment, right? Like you stumbled in and they're all working and they stop and look up. Hephaestus looks mad as hell, literally. And he was the one who forged the bolts that, and, and, and the, the, the hell fire. He's the one who creates a lot of that. So that's why I use that. I wasn't swearing. Um, and, and all of these other figures are reacting. Are any of them in a classical pose that you can identify from a statue? I can't identify a single, st- some of them are so close to statues. This is very close to something I can, th- I mean, they're clearly informed by it, right? Let me just go for a moment to this. And I want to talk about painterly technique. Um, so look at this. He orders, while he's in Rome, the same canvases that Titian was getting. He asked for the same makers, which are sail makers. Titian was the first one to really make works on canvas in large scale. And where does he go get them? He gets them from Venetian sail manufacturers. And they have very heavy weaves. And when you see Velasquez and Persis, you'll notice that they're very heavy. And he gessoed the, he barely gessoed them. Sometimes he didn't at all. He would put a civilian brown um, coat on them. And in this one, he takes advantage of the weave. It's hard to show here, but he loads the brush and he drags it across the surface above the head and he gets this very suggested light work. But then you go below into this from here to here and you get this wet into wet, very heavily painted, impastoed paint that's a completely different texture. He does the same thing here. You've got this still life moment which is done in like three colors, very lightly. And then he's got on the forge, this heavily impastoed coloring. And there's those moments, right? Beautifully, beautiful. I mean, and I'm not just talking about values. I'm talking about like the actual plastic use of the paints themselves are so varied in this piece, something that I don't think we saw earlier in Velasquez that he comes back with. And if I had to have a conversation with Velasquez, one of the things I'd want to ask him is what did he learn looking at paintings that changed the application of paint when he went to Rome? Because something changes when he comes back that I don't know if we fully discuss or understand. Well, I've got just five more minutes, which isn't enough to talk about everything, but I want to talk about a couple of paintings that are some of my favorites that he did that I don't think we can, we can in all good conscience leave without. One is, um, well, you know, I'm just going to cut to the chase. We're going to look at less many of this. Some have called this the greatest painting in the world. Some have called it the first modern painting that was ever done. It's, um, Hard to uh, describe the scale, 318 inches. Who wants the, how big is that? That can't be right. That's gotta be centimeters, right? It's three meters high. That's centimeters. It's three meters high. It's about 10 feet, a little more than 10 feet tall. Maybe 11, it's about that. It's a big piece. And it was put in the king's room, almost sitting on the floor. And the story about, just so you know narratively about what's happening in here, you are looking at Velasquez right here and you're standing behind, this has been adopted by so many artists since, but he's the first one to do it. You're standing behind his canvas. And Las Meninas is a reference to the women of the court. This is the daughter of the court being dressed up for her portrait by Velasquez, which we've got in a separate painting. And what's happening there in the back of the room? Who's that? It's a mirror. It's a reflection of the king and queen who you are. So if you're standing in front of Las Meninas, you are put into the position of the king and queen. You become the king and queen for a moment while you're looking at the painting. There are a lot of theories about this. Some say that's not true. Some say it is. It seems mostly true, right? That doesn't seem like a lot of conjecture. And everybody in the court is gathered around them. And Velasquez does a self-portrait of himself as he's painting the king and the queen. The, um, there's some famous moments in this that we know about. But first of all, like, this is Velasquez. Brilliant portrait. Look at that suggested hand. Pure Velasquez. 
That's the moment, his hand, you can totally see his hand, but it's not there, right? It's just suggested. You can see his palette too. It's a portrait of his palette and the palette that he has. This is, this is, if I were an artist, I would have this writ large on my wall, right? I'd have a giant version of that palette on my wall. And then he's got the reflection of the king and queen looking back at him. We know that um, he got the, um, the order of the cross of Santiago um, right as he was doing this. And he had the king paint the cross on his chest. So the king painted that. It's not all Velasquez, this painting. Charles the, I'm sorry, Philip the fourth. Um, had been taking painting lessons for some time and, and did that on his, uh, on his chest. Look at the still life moments of this. Look at that dog. Look at the shadow of the dog, that penumbra. Isn't that how it goes? It goes, umbra shade, penumbra is the, is, the, is the lighter part of the shade. And there's another one that I'm missing, isn't it? There's a penultimate penumbra. There's something there. Beautiful, beautiful moments. And I mean, I don't know how much we can say about this. Because we could spend an entire session just talking about it. Um, and maybe we'll save it for another time to talk about it all in. But I, I, I want to end on another painting, not on this one, before we go. And that's my favorite painting by Velasquez of all time, is the crucifixion. To me, this is the greatest painting in the world. It is, it was made for the private chapel of Philip IV. And Seeing it in person, it's hard to describe it. It's, it just doesn't do it justice. It's a beautiful piece no matter how you display it. But in person, it, 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 I was struck dumbfounded. I was dumbfounded the first time I saw it. Um, every time, it's hard to believe me being dumbfounded, but it's true. I was dumbfounded. And I think what struck me about it was how it's not, it's not a classical figure. It's not a natural figure. It's somewhere in between. I don't know how he achieves it. I see so many artists through the history of art talking about and trying to achieve this idea of something that is both derived as the ideal image, the ideal human figure, the platonic idea of what everything should be, and also those who are saying something from nature, and but something raised up from nature. This seems like one of the only paintings that is truly and seems to effortlessly do it. Are there really fingernails there? How is it? it it's, it's not gory, but it's also really painful to look at. And it has all of the strengths of the Velasquez. Look at the, look at the, 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 the wood grain. Look at the um, hands which are relaxed here. Those fingers which are relaxed. And the blood that's, that's coming from them, that's dried on the wood. And then look at how beautifully modeled. How many artists can do that much more? And it's, it's so sparsely modeled too, even though it's entirely suggested. I mean, it's not entirely suggested, but it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's one of those paintings that has to be seen in person. This is worth flying to Madrid for, this painting alone. Well, we're at the end. I want to give you a few books to look at. Velasquez by Jonathan Brown. Jonathan Brown is the greatest scholar of Velasquez that there is. He's been working on him for 40 years. He's written everything there is. He's x-rayed, radiographed, everything you can do to a Velasquez. And he's, he, he talks not only about it from an art historical perspective, he talks about it from a painter's perspective. He's brilliant. He does it in his next book, which I've got here, Velasquez Techniques of Genius, which he does with a restore at the Prado. The Prado has 60 of the 115 works that were done by Velasquez. And this one x-rays all of them and goes through them. Unbelievable book if you're a painter. Manny Velasquez, you can download this for free from the uh, Mets website. They have all their catalogs. They did this exhibition in the early 2000s, late 90s, and they take every painting that, they, they take studies by every artist who is looking at Manet, at Velasquez. They've got Corbe, Manet, Soroya, Sargent, Zorn, Boldini, 
every, it's just a whole bunch of great artists contrasted with, and what they were trying to pull out of Velazquez. Everything is Happening is my current favorite book. It was written by Michael Jacobs, who was a graduate of the Courtauld. He's been a, a, a newspaper art critic for years. He died last year. This book was unfinished. Um, but it's finished enough that it's a wonderful read of him going through um, Las Meninas. And it's, it's, a, it's a pure joy to go through it. By the way, Michael Jacobs, contemporary of Vern Swanson of the Courtauld. They knew one another. Um, Velasquez, The Complete Paintings. If you're looking for one coffee table book on Velasquez, which I know many of you will be, that book's it. Get that. It's $35 off Amazon. If you buy it in a store, it's going to be like $65. It's an unbelievable book. Um, and that's it. Thank you for coming, everyone. Next week, Poussin. We're really doing Poussin next week. Three minutes over. I was close. <laughs>